One on One with Jane Mitchell, featuring the legends. In 2014, the baseball world and San Diego said goodbye to a legend, the incomparable Jerry Coleman, who passed away after injuries due to a fall. He was 89. We told his story one-on-one -on -one in 1998, then in 2005 when he was honored at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Now we revisit those interviews, intertwining the poignant public memorial service celebrating his life. January 18th, 2014, a melancholy morning at the Padres Petco Park as fans, friends, family, and the U.S. Marine Corps take their place for a community tribute to Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Coleman and the things he loved the most. Our platform has been strategically uh, staged right here at a place that Jerry loved most of all around second base. I think he would have liked that. He left us as he lived, gracefully and without fanfare. I feel he's still up in the booth. I feel he should look up there and we should see that San Diego Padre cap and the microphone and chanting away, use both hands, don't catch it with one hand. And in fact, typical of Jerry, when he hung the star, it was always for somebody else. I can't remember one day in the 40 years where I looked up and I saw Jerry Coleman, I wasn't excited to see him. Jerry Coleman is the most beloved sports figure in the history of San Diego. His life spans three stellar professional dimensions, ranked in order of his priority. The military, with service in two wars, a decorated Marine pilot. You can't discount your country. That has to be number one, I mean, from a standpoint of what it means. Next, baseball for nine years, a New York Yankee Rookie of the Year and World Series MVP during the Yankees dynasty of the 40s and 50s. Playing is the best part of baseball. On the field is the best part of baseball. Johnson, to Coleman, to Hop. But if you can't be there, broadcasting's just as good because you're there every day. He's been on television and radio, New York to San Diego. Doctor, you can hang a star that baby. Woo. Jerry Coleman is an integral part of San Diego Padres baseball, but his life, career, and voice transcend a single team. What every fan knows is how important radio and television broadcasters are to the game. They paint us a picture, a wonderful picture, letting us feel as if we're in the ballpark. In recognition of this, the National Baseball Hall of Fame has awarded the Ford C. Frick Award for Excellence in Baseball Broadcasting annually since 1978. This year's recipient, the 29th, is Jerry Coleman. Yes, actually, I, I, I'm kind of surprised, to be honest with you. I never thought I would get here as a broadcaster or a player, to be quite frank with you, and to get here is really Delicious. Cooperstown is steeped with nostalgia. With a population of about 2,000, it attracts nearly 100,000 for induction weekend, more than visit the whole winter season. Busloads of students and little leaguers are among the tourists who file through to the brick shrine and its gold lettering, the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. The banners announced that the two players inducted in 2005 are Ryan Sandberg of the Chicago Cubs and Wade Boggs of the Boston Red Sox. Inside, the Hall of Fame gallery, with its oak-lined walls, in all its grandeur, is truly impressive. Yeah. 
sparking conversations. There you go, Manny. Bill Rizzuto, Seaver, Carlton, Mike Schmidt. And questions. Tom Seaver, no, it was George. With answers at one's fingertips, amazement at every glance. Who's that? Oh, John Moran, the announcer Who? ESPN. ESPN, very yeah, good. Yeah, he's, the, he's the announcer. He also so. played baseball. The tradition of inducting baseball's brightest stars and immortalizing them with a bronze plaque began in 1936 with strict criteria that narrows the field. Did you ever think, well, I guess I'm never going to make it? Absolutely. I'd never get here as a player. I didn't play long enough. I wasn't good enough. I mean, certainly, I think everybody that's in baseball going to the Hall of Fame as a player, that's the ultimate honor in baseball. Never mind executives or broadcasters or whatever. That's the ultimate. And I think uh, that these players, you know, that uh, I, I think it's incredible for them. I think it's wonderful. And I'm delighted to be part of it. A part of it on the same sacred ground as the Yankee greats he played alongside. Yogi Berra, Joe DiMaggio, Whitey Ford, Phil Rizzuto, Mickey Mantle, or those friends he once played against, like Boston's Ted Williams. And Jerry Coleman is a part of it because the Hall of Fame has long recognized other contributions to the game, namely baseball writers and broadcasters. The Scribes and Mikeman Wing is home to those honorees, with photos and a narrative of the annual winners. The Ford C. Frick Award is named after Frick, an inductee, devoted to baseball as a journalist, National League president, and commissioner. The award carries with it plenty of prestige. As fate would have it, the first two honored are Mel Allen and Red Barber, who Coleman worked with as a rookie broadcaster. Red was a great teacher, and he taught me things then that I use to this day, of what to eat, what not to eat, who to see, who not to see, and how to do it. He was wonderful, but Mel had the great command of the voice. <laughs> How about that? You know, and I could still hear him. But to go in and to be awarded this this honor with these guys who yeah, kind of neat. Yeah, kind of neat. Only three so far have made the transition from major league player to broadcaster to Ford C. Frick winner: catchers Joe Garagiola and Bob Euchre, and Jerry Coleman. The one ball pitch to Mickey is hit. While there is a formal description of the award, how it applies to Jerry Coleman is easily found when talking with baseball fans from around the country in Cooperstown. And what does the name Jerry Coleman mean to you? A uh, very colorful announcer for the Padres. That means to me, growing up, I saw him playing second base for the uh, New York Yankees against the Dodgers and all those World Series. Well, anybody that's been in baseball for that long has to have the love for the game. I remember him doing the CBS games when I was a kid and uh, bringing the game to life, just making it more interesting. Whether you're a Yankee fan or, or a Padre fan, you, you're always going to remember, you know, your beginning as a, as a kid, you know, in, 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 in watching your favorite team and those, those broadcasters tend to just, they stick out in your mind forever. You resonate with people, not just Padres fans. Does you don't re I don't recognize that. It's the game and the microphone, and whether I'm in San Diego or Timbuktu or Kalamazoo or doing a national game, I really had never said, oh, boy, I'm talking to 30 million people out there. I never thought that. It's just the game again. You have to divorce yourself from that, from sound, from the thought process. And I'm not being noble. I'm not being shy. I'm not being anything. I just don't think about it. His humility and talent appreciated also by inductees George Brett, and Gary Carter. And I always enjoyed his interviews and um, just enjoyed his, his way and his personality. He was always friendly to me. I've been an American leaguer my whole life and he's been in San Diego for how many years? Yeah. You know, and I, I know who he is and I couldn't tell you who the, uh, I know Vince Scully's with the Dodge. I can't tell you who does the Giant games. I can't tell you who does the Rocky games. I can't tell you who does the Met games. I can't tell you who does, well, the Cubs on radio. I don't know who does that. But you know, he does the San Diego Padre games. In his 40 years as the voice of the Padres, there have been nine general managers, 15 managers, 11 different uniforms, if you talk about road trips, 22 different uniforms, two different stadiums, and the stadium has had three different names.
but through all the years and the 822 players that wore a Padres uniform. Jerry was the person who every Padres fan could relate to. He was the very soul of this organization. Jerry Coleman's story of humble beginnings is next on One on One. We welcome now a man who represents the Commissioner of Baseball, a man that we will honor in the induction of the Baseball Hall of Fame as a manager this summer, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Torrey. Watching the Yankees, as I said, I, I was not a Yankee fan. In fact, it was dangerous. I was living in Brooklyn. I was a New York Giant fan. But growing up, just the way he played the game, he, he just caught my attention. Always played hard, uh, never appeared to be a whiner. And, and then you found out all the other attributes that, that Jerry had. But when you met him, it was great to find out he was everything that you expected him to be. And where our greatest generation and the great American game intersect, you find Jerry Coleman. The kind of man whose spirit makes baseball forever our national pastime. While Jerry Coleman was a man of humility who rarely talked about his own story, in 1998 he accepted our first invitation to explore his journey. His story begins in the city by the bay, San Francisco. He was born Gerald Francis Coleman, September 14, 1924. He lived with his older sister and parents at 424 Broderick Street. His mother was a homemaker. His father worked in the post office. His childhood is not storybook. In the 30s, during the Depression, his parents separated. What made it all the more difficult, his mother was injured and needed a brace to walk. Every time that brace went, she went down. And I used to walk from where we lived up to the UC hospital. It took all day long to get there and back to get that brace fixed. Really sad. She ended up okay, but uh, she had some hard times. The depression were hard years. It still pains him, but it's clear his mother's strength has had a profound influence on him. My mother really raised me. She was my guardian angel. While his relationship with his father was not strong, Coleman recalls his father playing professional ball in the same company as Ty Cobb. He was a catcher. He's five six, much shorter than I. I don't think he had hit too well. That's what kept him <laughs> at the triple A level or double A in those days. Well, he gave me my first glove. Who's going to yeah. pay $10 for a catcher's glove? No Couldn't kidding. afford it. With little money and no place to go, summers for Jerry Coleman were spent at Big Wreck in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. We would show up here religiously about, what, 10 o'clock in the morning, and the rest of the guys would come. We'd make up games. And wh where was that screen you used to hit off of? The screen was right here. And there was no diamond no as they diamond. have it. We this played on the brand grass. New. One of his friends then, and now, Charlie Silvera, who ultimately became the Yankees catcher behind Yogi Berra. Ten years old? Well, that's how old we were when we started playing. The late 30s, early 40s were a time when San Francisco's own Joe DiMaggio, the son of Italian immigrants with a sweet swing, dominated sports headlines. All we thought about were being Yankees of the future. Coleman and Silvera were among hundreds of boys hoping a Yankee scout might spot their talent, but it seemed unimaginable. Until one day, when I was a sophomore in high school, a man came up to me by the name of Joe Devine. He was a scout for the Yankees. And he said that he thought I could be a professional baseball player. And I go, huh? You know, <laughs> really? Coleman was offered a spot on the Yankees local team for hot prospects, the Canela Yankees. I said, I can't do it because I'm playing for the A. Romeo Fish Company this year. <laughs> the next season, he joined the Canela Yankees and by his senior year at Lowell High School had baseball and basketball scholarships to USC. But then an experience that would change his life's course the onset of World War II. Anybody who had anything going for them wanted to get in and do their part, whatever it was. 
At 17, Coleman wasn't old enough to join the service, so he signed with the Yankee Scout and played in the minor leagues in Wellsville, New York. But on the verge of his 18th birthday, he returned to San Francisco, hoping to join the V-5 Naval Aviation Cadet Program. Gee, that sounds romantic. Let's, do, let's, let's become pilots. He passed the physical and had letters of recommendation in hand. Said I was a wonderful, sterling character. But then the commander saw his mediocre high school transcript. He said, I can't sign this. And I, you know, almost fell off my chair. I said, well, why, sir? And he explained to me, he said, well, it cost $300,000 to train a pilot. And you're going to get part of the way through, halfway through somewhere, and you're going to fail. It's going to cost the government money. Well, I started talking. And convinced him to let him in. I was determined to prove to him I could make it. I had held my own. I, I learned to fly. And before he was 20, he was overseas with the Marines in the Solomon Islands, then Guadalcanal, Green Island, and the Philippines under General MacArthur's command. So we became the first group of planes to use in close air support because we were very accurate in what we could do in dropping bombs. We had 1,000 pound bombs. And I never had trouble taking the order. I never said, hey, why are we doing this? Because I respected the people who were ahead of me. But even his uniform couldn't shield his emotions about war. Well, it's scary. I don't, I don't think anybody that flew a plane and goes on a combat mission is totally immune from a certain amount of fright. There's no question about it. People die. Life and death in combat it is an indelible but distant memory. You uh, don't really spend your lifetime thinking about it behind you. And you know, we read stories, you know, there people write this stuff, you know, about whatever you did, about 11 million people are out there helping us, you know, there are 11 or 12 million people under arms in World War II. While he was home on leave, the war ended, his duty fulfilled. But for the kid who had to talk his way into serving his country, Coleman more than proved to the recruiter that he would succeed. Decorated with two distinguished flying crosses, seven air medals, and two naval citations. His first tour of duty changed him, and what he took away from his World War II experience, more than the 57 missions, more than the medals, is special. The reason it was special to me was because I started out scared to death, very young, and didn't think I could compete. What it did for me, it, it brought me up to the fact that I was able to compete. I was very young, I made it through, and it, it was the single greatest thing I've ever done. And the only disagreement we ever had, ever, is him saying, don't be talking about me like I'm a, like I'm a big hero, because I'm not. Only the ones that did not come back are heroes. And I would tell him, Jerry, I, I disagree. I disagree that if you hadn't done your job with that incredible courage, others would have lost their lives and not come home. And because of you and men like you, that's why you are a hero. He didn't believe me then, but believe me now. It's the truth. Jerry Coleman's commitment to country would be tested again how he answered the call, and finding his broadcasting voice, all coming up on One on One. With Jerry Coleman's World War II service finished, that other world he had left behind was beckoning. But he hadn't picked up a baseball in three years, so spring training in Florida in 1946 was like starting all over again. Jerry Coleman knew he was a good fielder with a great arm, but it took some time to see where he'd fit in to the Yankees organization. At the farm team in Kansas City, he played second base for the first time. And I made some terrible blunder, and the next day I was on my way to Binghamton where I spent the year. That was a ball. So close, but so far, the last man cut from the big club's roster at spring training two years in a row. Then his minor league manager told him to make the big leagues, he had to do two things. You learn to use your bat and you gotta quit smoking. Nobody ever said that to me. About learning to use my bat was one thing, but smoking? He quit and he was called up to the big club that August. I sat on the bench and shook, hoping they wouldn't put me in because it was a pennant race. They never put me in, I just sat there. And he watched, 
batter after batter, the great Joe DiMaggio, Charlie Keller, Tommy Henrick, and realized. I'm doing this wrong. So I went home that winter and put lead in the end of a bat, swung it every day, half hour in the morning, half hour at night, and got into a choke-up situation. From that point on, I got to the big leagues and made it. He vividly remembers his first day playing in the majors in 1949, second base. First man up hit a ball right at me and bang, right through my leg. I guess I was scared to death. Next one hit a one shot hot at me. I couldn't think about it. I mean, it was a bullet. Caught it like this, made a double play and saved me. It would come to be known as a storied time in baseball. And Jerry Coleman was becoming a part of that story. Jerry he Coleman was, was a star. He, he was a star on a club that had stars. Now, he, he wasn't the greatest star because we had Mantle and DiMaggio and those type of stars and Barra, but Jerry was an everyday player. Baseball's greatest hitter, Ted Williams, recalls one of his worst career moments came thanks to a hit from Coleman. October 2nd, 49, a playoff game, the Yankees versus the Red Sox, bottom of the ninth. And Jerry was the hitter. Here's the pitch. One on, little looper in the short right field. And he hit a ball that was just a little just a little humpback line drive. To this day, he said it was the hardest, stingingest line drive he ever saw. And Coleman is out of third for three run score. That, that ball won the game for him. He has really been a great asset to baseball. Coleman earned Rookie of the Year honors that season. Then the next year, most valuable player in the World Series. And Jerry Coleman thus becomes the hitting hero of the New York Yankees. It was a magic time. Baseball dominated sports. And the Yankees dominated baseball. So it was our divine right, you see, to win. And we thought that's the way it should be. It was not good for baseball. But if you're on that team, you think it's wonderful. But especially in the days when the teams had total control of a player's fate, the glory and glamour came at a price. It was a desperate struggle every day, every year. The only fun thing about it was when it was over. And if you didn't perform, you were traded. And nobody that I know of wanted to be traded from the Yankees to any place else. Because nowhere else had players like teammate and friend Joe DiMaggio. And he had an imperial presence that no one else has ever had. And I was kid Joe. I said, you know, without us infielders, you're nothing. Coleman's amused by the fact that the only picture he knows of showing him hitting a home run May 24th, 1951, the newspaper caption says the hitter was Joe DiMaggio. But those sorts of things don't really seem to bother Coleman. He loved to play and relish the intimacy of the game. There's nothing that I still remember more than playing in Ebbets Field in the World Series. And there was a woman named Hilda Chester with a cowbell. And she was about from here to you, clanging that bell at me. Said, you guys, you was bums, you never get you. And it was great. I mean, there they were right there. You reach out and touch them. Jerry Coleman, the player, is described as a dancer who played second base with grace and ease. He was acrobatic. He was, he, he, he was quick on his feet. Very, very good second baseman. And not a bad hitter. And he was a real good cog in that whole outfit. With another Yankee World Championship barely in the record books, America was at war again, this time Korea. And the Marines, desperate for pilots, asked Coleman to volunteer. And I said, well, I haven't been in a plane in five years. And I said, I have a wife and two children. And I said, I'm not really in the mood to volunteer, if you want to know the truth of it. And he said, well, we're going to get you. Coleman, used to facing fastballs and making double plays, was back in the cockpit, dropping bombs. But this time, he came face to face with death when his Corsair's engine quit on takeoff. And at all these bombs, I let them go. And one of the bombs, I think, hit my tail and flipped me up. My propeller caught that huge propeller on these uh, F-4 years, and I flipped over. And I, the only thing I remember is my knees were behind my ears, and my head was bent over, and I was passing out. Coleman was one of only four baseball players called back to fly in Korea. Ted Williams was among them. My closest relationship in my own mind with Jerry Coleman, he was a Marine, a Marine pilot. Jerry Coleman flew 63 missions in Korea, was honored with six more air medals and a Navy citation. He retired as a lieutenant colonel. What I did in the service took more out of what I had to give than anything else I've ever done. 
After missing two major league seasons, he was welcomed home to a Yankees contract and played four more years. He also roomed and looked after a raw young talent, Mickey Mantle, who received a lot of late night phone calls. I told the uh, switchboard officer, unless it's the President of the United States, Mickey's wife or my wife, this phone shall not ring. Jerry Coleman was part of history in the making. While a Yankee, the team played in the World Series eight of nine years. He played in six, missing two because of the war. 57 was his best year. At the end, he hit a home run. But I had no idea it was my last game. His last at bat in the majors. In the offseason, Yankees management gave him an option to work in the club's front office. He offered me the same salary I was getting as a player. And I said, well, I've got nine and a half years. I'd like to get 10. What if I don't take this offer? He said, well, you could be traded. I said, I'll take it. Out of uniform, he tried the front office's personnel department for three years, then was the national sales manager for Van Heusen Shirts for a year. But unlike baseball, he didn't look forward to another season. So he accepted an offer by a friend at CBS Television. I said, Bill, is that job still open? He said, yep. He said, come on. So Pee Wee Reese and Dizzy Dean and I made a, a troika for the game of the week for CBS every uh, Saturday and Sunday. So begins Chapter 3 in Jerry Coleman's career history as the baseball pregame show host for CBS. The third game I did, I'm doing Cookie Lava Jetto on the field in Comiskey Park. He's managing the Senators and they play the national anthem. I don't know what to do. I have, what, shall I keep going? Or what, I mean, I totally, well, I guess I just keep going. I found out at that point that when the national anthem was played, by 1963, he returned to the Yankees as their radio broadcaster. The one ball pitch to Mickey is hit out of here! That ball is on its way! In the booth with Mel Allen and Red Barber. Two of the great broadcasters of all time, Hall of Famers, and Red was a great teacher and he liked me and he taught me. In the early 70s, his first wife and family wanted to be in California, so he left the Yankees broadcast booth for the Angels and did sports at KTLA. For the Padres' fourth Major League season, 1972, Buzzy Bavese hired him to be the lead broadcaster. Way back, it's gone! 31 in a row! A two-run homer for Benito Santiago! Other than one year when he served as the Padres manager in 1980, Coleman has been known as the radio voice of the Padres. With Ted Leitner, I'm Jerry Coleman. Action coming up shortly. And for 15 years, he hosted Channel 4 San Diego's Padres magazine. By mid-season, the ball club can be pretty beat up. A fixture of San Diego baseball, he's been there for the great seasons, including two National League championship years. Go ahead, go ahead. And the Padres draped the National League flag around their shoulders for 1998. And he's been there for the tough seasons. He's done the honors of emceeing significant events in team history, including retiring numbers, retiring players. Today is the last day of one of the greatest players in the last hundred years of baseball, Tony Gwynn saying goodbye to the Padres' first major league home and hello to their new ballpark. They built something here that will serve you for years and years to come. For his contributions at home, he's been gracious in accepting his induction into the Padres' Hall of Fame. An 80th birthday party at a ballpark filled with friends and fans and a painted star by the broadcast booth, a gift befitting the icon who's given so much to San Diego. Perhaps the most special tribute at the ballpark in 2012, for his 88th birthday, the Padres unveiled a bronze statue and three panels depicting the three dimensions of his career. And when it came time to be honored by the Padres with a statue, he asked that he be depicted in a Marine fighter uniform. Before traveling to Cooperstown for the ceremony in 2005, the Colonel received yet another honor from the Marines. That's next on One on One. And later, the glorious induction weekend and some final farewells from his friends and family.
While some major leaguers left the game to do military duty, Jerry Coleman is the only big leaguer to see active combat in two wars. For that and more, the United States Marine Corps bestowed upon him a national honor in 2005. Just outside the nation's capital, the U.S. Marine Corps base, Quantico, Virginia. This patriotic yet modest luncheon setting bestows a new dimension to the pride of being the few, the proud, the Marines. In 2001, the Marine Corps Sports Hall of Fame was established to honor Marine athletes, past and present, and to recognize the contributions these athletes have made to our Corps and country. This year, the Marine Corps has selected Jerry Coleman, Lloyd Kieser, Elroy Hirsch, and Paul Erzin as the 2005 Marine Corps Sports Hall of Fame inductees. What did it mean for you to be honored and to be inducted into the, the Marine Corps Hall of Fame? Well, the uh, Commandant was there, General Nehege, and uh, had a chat with him and get to s sit with him and talk to him, and that was neat. The film itself was a highlight that I think if you're, you don't have to explain a lot of things if you see that. Upon graduation, Coleman departed to Guadalcanal and was assigned to the 341 Marine Scout Bombing Squadron, the Torrid Turtles. Did you get emotional at all? Did you, uh, did, did, did you get flashbacks of those yeah, times? Yeah, a little bit. And um, try to stay away from that because uh, there are some sad moments. Yeah, yeah. For his valor, he's a decorated pilot, and his country and fellow citizens call him a hero. Well, I don't know about hero. I, the only heroes I know, they're all dead. And I, they, to me, I, I, I discount that because, you know, there are 11 million people under arms in World War II, and there are half a million people in Korea. And I was just one of the guys, you know. And I, I, don't, I don't say war. I think I was lucky to survive, period. I wasn't a hero. Did what I had to do, the best I could do. And that was all. And uh, I think people tend to, you know, the farther away you get from that, the more they glamorize it, the more heroic it becomes. And it's not heroic. It's dirty, mud, and sometimes death. You've said in the past that your military, being a Marine, though, was the most important thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. Because of what it represented. It's our country. And I've always had a philosophy, my country, right or wrong, and once you're in there, go for it. Don't give up, keep going. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Coleman. Jerry Coleman's award will be displayed with others, including Ted Williams, in the new National Museum of the United States Marine Corps. Coleman's wife, Maggie, whose father was a Marine, underscores how this is so poignant and special to her husband of 25 years. For Jerry, it's family first, country second, and baseball third. And um, he is a patriot of the first order. So, and so proud of being a Marine. So it was, it was a wonderful day. Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Coleman is hereby inducted into the United States Marine Corps Sports Hall of Fame. Jerry, on behalf of a grateful nation, we cannot begin to express our appreciation and pleasure to have had such a valiant Marine among our, our ranks. A leader among leaders, he was truly one of the few and the proud. And we will miss him dearly, but never forget him or what he did for his country. Semper Fi Colonel.
He could be the funniest guy I ever knew, intentionally, and at times <laughs> unintentionally. It just happened. It's the way he was. Yes, he had a problem with names. Yes, he did. He had a problem with names. And it didn't come on with old age. He never had old age. He was broadcasting up there with us in September of last season. No, no old age with him, none whatsoever. But he would get excited and he would say things kind of strangely, and most of them early in his career. So yes, he said that Tucker Ashford slides into second with a stand-up double. And a high fly ball to right field, Winfield going back, going back. He hits his head against the wall. It's rolling towards second base. <laughs> and we worshiped this guy and respected him so incredibly much. And you heard the stuff, because all I had to do, and make, make no mistake, I knew always it was Jerry and Ted. It was never Ted and Jerry. I was just along for the ride on the coattails. Trust me, I know that. We continue now with the summer of 2005. Well, here's the Colonel. And we're ready to go. Here come Jim Edmonds, followed by... One of Coleman's trademark calls has roots in his junior high spelling class. A gold star meant perfection, something he never got. So he's selective when giving one away. Woody fires. Hard shot up the middle. Oh, what a stop by Loretta. Up in the middle with a front hole. Doctor, you can hang a star that, baby. Woo. Meanwhile... Cooperstown is ready for the weekend. New Yorker Ken Stevens is hoping to have Jerry sign some long-saved memorabilia. One is a 1978 Family Fun Center uh, postcard, and the other is an old advertisement that he had doing some kind of ad here. Jerry Coleman is still at the Marine Corps induction as 38 Hall of Famers and guests are on hand at a Friday afternoon ceremony, the rededication of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum after a major expansion project. With the hall also building an endowment, million dollar donors are recognized with a plaque. One says San Diego Padres in honor of Jerry Coleman. Across town, the stately Otisaga Hotel by the lake is secured for Hall of Famers, honorees, and those with special access. After leaving Quantico, Virginia, and reboarding Padres owner John Moore's plane, the Coleman clan arrives. So exciting. Inside, who better to greet him but former teammate Yogi Berra. It took me 50 years to get here, for God's oh, sake. You <laughs> I thought Carl was great. What was he like to play with? What, what Fine, you yeah. good, you good. Saved me a lot of airs. Then Jerry and his family zip away to a private party at the home of Hall of Fame Chairman Jane Forbes Clark for honorees, Hall of Famers, and guests, including childhood friend Bobby Brown. The two started in the Yankees' farm system together. Uh, the four of us got together and uh, had some pictures taken, which I'm going to get copies of. That'll be fun because I'd like to see the pictures in 1949 and 50, and then these in 19 or 2005 or six. Uh, it, it was great. Saturday morning, time for the Hall of Fame and Friends golf tournament. Jerry's not on the links, but there's no shortage of thoughts about him. Detroit's Al Kaline played against him in 1953. I mean, he was uh, one of the, the strengths of the Yankees in those days, that, that uh, Rizzuto, Coleman, uh, uh, double play combination. So, you know, he was, he was an outstanding ball player and uh, very happy to see him go in the hall. And then there's teammate Whitey Ford. Jerry really, you know, helped me and uh, told me how to behave in the big leagues. And he's always been a gentleman. You know, between the, the World War II and the Korean War, I think, Jerry probably missed about five seasons. Do you remember, though, um, talking about it and, and has his making that choice and, and what that was like? Or Jerry was so quiet about it. He, you know, he never said anything. And all of a sudden, one day Jerry's gone, and we say, "Where did he go?" And he went, "He said he's back in the service." And but Jerry never talked much about it. When talking became his next profession. Coleman affected more guys like Braves pitcher Phil Necro. I used to get knocked out early in the Padres games. I'd go down and listen to him on the radio. So, uh, don't probably don't get to see him as much, but uh, looking forward to seeing him up here. And I know it's 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 well deserved and it's well overdue too. Reds catcher Johnny Bench was a broadcast partner. He loves being a part of the game, and it shows. Uh, he gets so excited sometimes that emotionally he uh, malaprops. 
but don't we all? Uh, and, and I think that's what's so lovable about Jerry Coleman is that he is what we as baseball players appreciate because it's not the, you know, I, hey, you know, yeah, yeah. He's got, he doesn't have the announcer's voice or, you know, he's got the guy that, that every day inflects into his thoughts what happens on the field. And that's as simple as it gets. As for new inductee Ryan Sandberg. We go back to the year, uh, the the 84 year Cubs Padres. I know he was around for that. And, uh, although I don't, I don't want to think about it. Go ahead, go ahead, it is gone! The Padres win it! And of course, two former Padres, Raleigh Fingers and Dave Winfield, who played for him and listened to him. I don't think I ever heard him rip one guy, but uh, I bet in the in the four years I played in San Diego, I think I heard Old Doctor about 7,000 times. So <laughs> More than a niche for himself. He's carved his own piece of history, and he deserves, you know, credit for it. By mid-morning, Jerry Coleman is signing autographs in town, with his share of proceeds going to charity. Good morning, Mr. Coleman. How are you? He's alongside friend Andy Strasberg and one-time broadcast partner Ralph Kiner. Pretty good, huh? Fans are cordial, seeking signatures and sharing stories. Yeah, my grandfather's here, the Newark Bears, Frank Smith. You're kidding. And I also had a 1951 uh, Yankees team photo signed. I had him sign two bats and a book, Pride of October. And uh, he played for the Yankees back in the 50s when they used to beat my Brooklyn Dodgers all the time. So I really hate them, but I still get their autograph. Huh? Jerry's link to the Yankees of the past and everybody today, uh, he really transcends baseball for all generations. Congratulations again, Jerry. Thank you so much. True to form, Jerry Coleman walks back to the hotel. Compliment, though, to know that they want your to be a part of that. And At to this meet stage, you. yes, very complimentary because I've been out of I left the Yankees uh, the, the 50, almost 50 years ago yeah. and started with them uh, 57 years ago. It's been a long time. And uh, the fact that there are still people who are interested fascinates me. So are you getting ready for you, you have a big night ahead of you now? You never get ready. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's always a challenge about how you cut it. You gotta wear a shirt and tie tonight and a jacket. He manages and is prompt for a private reception on the grand lawn of the Otis Saga. I saw Mike and everybody over there. Where? Yeah. Where he says hello to old friends in his new Hall of Fame family. July of 45 to, to pick up carriage to hit Japan in November and the war ended. Then, after a formal dinner, a trolley ride to the Hall of Fame for a dessert reception, where baseball meets Hollywood. Fans line the streets, cheering. As Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer and honorees arrive to a red carpet. Jerry, what sticks out to you most uh, of this weekend when you're, you're getting off a bus with these guys and you're going in there and you belong in there? Well, this is the epitome for anybody in baseball. The Hall of Fame is the golden shrine. I'm so delighted to be here. I'm excited to be here. And I'm so happy my family is with me. That makes it even more important. Congratulations. Jerry Coleman, yeah. everybody. A night to remember before a day you'll never forget. In his 89 years, Jerry Coleman experienced the thrills of baseball, the gravity of war, the satisfaction of a life well lived. And on July 31st, 2005, this veteran would experience a new wave of emotion as he reached yet another milestone. A game like this was just the beginning of a dream for Jerry Coleman, a kid from San Francisco who wanted to be a Yankee. A lifetime later, nearly 30,000 fans take their place on a green field to celebrate how dreams come true and then some. This weekend, the star will get hung for him. The Ford C. Frick Award winner, Jerry Coleman. The stage is filled with 48 of the 60 living Hall of Famers. Ladies and gentlemen, the Duke of Flatbush, 
Duke Snyder. The Say Hey Kid, Willie Mays. Please welcome Willie McCovey. Lou Braun. Kirby Puckett. Peter Gammons honored for writing. The two inductees, along with a national ESPN audience, are part of the day when Jerry Coleman takes his place in history. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Coleman. Good afternoon. I am delighted to be here. There's no question about that. One of the greatest days of my life is this day here in Cooperstown. I would like to introduce to you my family, my wife, Maggie. Always feels like somebody's more deserving, somebody's worked harder, somebody's done something more important. So it's, it's just nice to be with him, and he is allowing himself to enjoy it. My daughter, Chelsea. All he has ever wanted to do for me and his entire family is provide. It's good to see him sort of sit back and just relax and realize that for a day, it's about him. My daughter, Diane. I have adored him forever. He's an incredible role model, and I just couldn't be more proud of him. My granddaughter, Courtney. And my grandson, Christopher. And a pot full of extended family all over the place. I've had a partner in broadcasting for 25 years, and I can't go by without introducing Mr. Ted Leitner, one of the best broadcasters you've never heard. He's great. And the best owner in the history of baseball, Mr. John Moore. I'm delighted to be on this platform with a couple of guys, and the third that's missing, but Yogi Berra and Whitey Ford. And I'm sorry that the scooter, Phil Rizzuto, isn't here, who I shared broadcast duties and double play duties with for 16 years in the New York Yankees. In a dominant sea of Chicago Cubs blue, a group of 40 in Padres gear and O oh, Doctor t-shirts travel here with the Padres radio station. We all came because we wanted to honor him and respect him for all he's done for us in the community and as a veteran. It's really nice that other people appreciate him too, and he's not just San Diego, he is a national figure. Tim Flannery, who broke into the bigs when Coleman was managing, pays tribute in song. I can hear that old familiar voice Radio and Dad's old car and still others with the team or with especially close ties who couldn't attend watched his short five-minute speech with great affection. It just shows the true character of, of Mr. Coleman that uh, is very respectful and very under, understands what, what he's done in his life, but uh, there's no way in shape or form for flaunting it by any means. And I learned so much from him and he, he to this day still won't even you know give himself any credit. He taught me a lot about the game just through conversation. I can hear that old familiar voice. Can you capsulize your philosophy of how you've lived your life? Well you can say do unto others pretty much. I try to do that. treat other people the way that uh, I would like to be treated. Oh doctor you were there. 98, the boys played great. While Jerry Coleman was laid to rest at the Miramar National Cemetery with a private service, his younger daughter Chelsea spoke on behalf of the family at the ballpark. It is hard to find the words to express what we wanted to say today to honor and remember our father, husband, grandfather, and brother. We wrote and deleted dozens of opening sentences before we realized that our overwhelming sentiment was thank you. If he were here, he would probably play this moment down, ask if we'd known that he won the war single-handedly, or suggest we should all have something better to do than focus on him. But deep down, he would be proud because here, represented in this space, are the three things he cared for most, his country, his game, and the people who loved him and who he in turn loved. 
And that includes you, San Diego baseball fans, because you were his second family. We could not have made it through the last two weeks without the incredible support of the Padres and the Marine Corps. We will be forever grateful. Semper Fi and beat LA. <laughs> well, I want to thank the fans for putting up with me for 35 years in San Diego. What more can I say? I, I, I was in Japan broadcasting games. I played exhibition games all through Japan. I played exhibition games in Okinawa, in the Philippines, on Guam, in the Hawaiian Islands, and broadcast games in the Hawaiian Islands. I made a trip to Vietnam for baseball. All of this is for baseball. And I have broadcast and been in every small village and major city in the United States. But today, on this golden day here in Cooperstown, a journey that started 63 years ago, I feel that finally, finally I've come home. Thank you. Words that pays a thousand Of the merry home stars For the Colonel During his later years especially, Jerry Coleman was celebrated and respected for who he was and what he did. With his passing, it is clear that not only do we collectively hang a star on his whole journey, but this legend and such a good man will live on in the hearts of fans, friends, and family forever. I'm Jane Mitchell. Thank you for watching One on One. For backstory content, visit 4sd.com.